You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. We are into July and uh, this is a, a this July is really the start of the summer planting season. There's a whole nother planting time. So if you're from other areas, let's say Phoenix, the desert, Palm Springs, you don't plant in the summer. It's ridiculous. It's just too hot. You go and you travel to the countryside where it's high altitude. It's you're going to the pines. You're playing golf uh, where it's cool. You're not out in your backyard. It's just too hot. Well, in the mountains. This is where people are coming to, to enjoy. So there's a whole series of plants in the summer that you can, that are unique, that are different. So we really have five seasons, the way I I explain uh, the seasonality. You know, we're a four season climate, all of us, but really I put perennials in there as their unique, their own uh, season perennials are this this is the time of year when they bloom they they start to show off they actually have flushed growth in the spring their perennials come back from the roots so perennial and permanent both start with p well they they come up and so there, it's hard to be inspired by a plant tag in the spring but starting in june through july perennials actually bloom for us and so this is a great time at this start of this uh, leading edge of the monsoon season to put perennials into the ground. This is when your echinaceas, your gallardias, uh, all your Russian sage, uh, the hyssops, this is when they're all in bloom. Uh, you can see, you don't have to look at a plant tag. You can touch and smell and feel and taste some of the perennials now. So it's unique to the summer planting season. This is when you see a butterfly bush. Your best selection of butterfly bush is now at your garden centers in the summer because this is when they bloom. The other common name for butterfly bush is is a summer blooming lilac because it's got the same lilac flower. But lilacs they bloomed two three months ago. They're so last season. Uh, the other seasons that we have, I call it spring. We just came out of that. Uh, I put June as its own first part of July as its own perennial season. We go to summer. Now this is when your crepe myrtles and your Rosa Sharon's and your, uh, you know, the butterfly bush, the, the Russian sage go into bloom. Then you've got fall, fall colors. So we're famous for our aspen groves and maples and the, all that fall colored plants. It's a whole season into itself. And then winter evergreens. You need at least 20% of your yard dedicated to evergreens, or you'll feel naked. You'll feel exposed in the winter. So you want 20% to spring, 20% to summer, 20% should have fall color, and 20% should be uh, evergreens. So it's there all the time, the anchors. Uh, The uh, last 20%, you throw that towards whatever you like the most. So if you're mainly a, a a summer residence up in the mountains and you spend your winters down in Phoenix, don't commit to as many evergreens because you don't care. You're down at your summer home in the winter. When it's cold out, you're going, eh, I don't care. I'll come back and when it's warm. Commit more of your landscape towards summer and fall bloomers because that's typically when you're up here for, for you, your cabin or your second home. Uh, my Alaska folks, we've got a surprising number of Alaskans, some Canadians, mainly Alaskans that winter, at least here in the Prescott area that I, I cater to. Uh, they they like to spend their winters here. So I tell them, we'll commit more to winter evergreens and spring bloomers. And for whatever you do, don't plant you know, f- fruit trees and things that, that fruit are messy, can attract rats and have issues. Go for the lilacs. Go for those winter colorful conifers that just have so many textures and colors, the evergreens. Commit more to that because this is when you're enjoying. In the summer, you're back to your Alaska home. So you kind of tweak it. To, you want to balance, but then you tweak it to whatever is enjoyable to you. If you're a a cottage garden or English garden kind of person, have that smattering of color, all colors and textures and just these big borders of flowers, commit to that. Go for that. Just go all in because it's just fun. That's your thing. That's your therapy. Go for it. Uh, that That's the time to do it. Right now, uh, the summer season, this is your planting season for... 
your 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 summer bloomers. I mean, I don't even have crepe myrtles in the spring. You can't get one. If I do, it's leftover from the previous year, and you probably don't really want it. Uh, now I've got fresh selection, all in bud, all in bloom, and they're just growing like crazy. They're just going to pop and they're vibrant. You can just pick, you can see and smell the colors. You don't have to look at a plant tag. So that's a beautiful thing about, so, and they prefer to be planted when the soil is warm. They would rather be planted now in the summer than in the spring where they're cold, shivering, waiting for it to finally be summer. These plants get kind of chilly. In fact, people will call us going, hey, my uh, Rosa Sharon hasn't leafed out yet. Oh, it's dead. Go, no, just hold on. Give it some time. My grapes haven't woken up. Everything else in the yard is, is taking off. Well, no, grapes, they actually prefer summer. They like growing now, not, not later. Uh, so some things are just later to wake up because they like the soil to be warm and the nighttime temperatures to be warmer. And so those summer bloomers, they prefer this. They prefer being planted during the monsoonal, this, this pattern that we have. If you're doing... I think spruce and pine. I think they do better this time of year. Now, you Midwestern folks, you actually you actually believe that fall is the best time to plant. Fall is for planting. You've been brainwashed all your all your life, and it's a good time to plant. But I find that more success is had with a summer planting for pine trees, uh, uh, spruce, junipers, cypress, cedars, fir. They do better. The reason. In the spring, you plant those, and it's got this tender new growth of this violent temperature swings and a wind that just won't stop. And so they're, they're tender new growth. It's tender. It's just You look at it wrong. It fades or wilts. Or, but now it's all hardened off. So that new growth that formed last spring, now it's, it's hardened off, and now it's tough as nails. But you've got all this growing season before the cold of winter hits. So you've got six months of rooting and hardening off and 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 rooting into that surrounding warm soil, you'll find that your take, your your success rate goes up. In the fall, it's it's good, but I find too many customers, they turn their irrigation off, they plant it in, in November or December for a Christmas tree or something, and then they turn their irrigation off, and then it's cold out, and they just forget to go water it, and then we haven't had moisture in, in a month and a half, and they expect the tree to just be happy and thrive outside by itself if you plant it now you've got much more root mass before the winter comes and now you've got more fudge factor uh to more error factor where you're less likely to kill it with mistakes or just forgetting or i travel and i just forgot to come back and water it and my irrigation was off and it died over the winter we heard that a lot this year but i find that the root if you plant it now during the start of that monsoon, you get a larger root mass and more success and less problems down the road. I That goes for grapes, blackberries, fruit trees, any of your shade trees. This is the time to plant your shade trees because you can get a feel of, of exactly, you know, it's blistering hot on the west side. I need a tree within that's going to grow uh, 20 feet. I want it to be at least 20 feet to 30 feet tall and shade my patio so I can enjoy it. This is the time when you really can spot that shade tree just spot on uh, without error. Whereas you're kind of guessing a little bit on what the summer sun's going to be in February or March. Now it's a good time and it will flush out and grow more. You're setting the stage. Again, the more roots you can get on that, uh, the, the better off you are. In fact, I tell folks, back up. The month of June is the most difficult month to grow things. It's hot, it's dry, it's there's no humidity. Then the rains come in July. So so if June is your hottest month, the more months you can have a plant in the ground before the month of June, the better off you are because you've got that much. You've got 11 months of root growth on that plant. So July would be the ideal time to get ready for June of 2000 next year. So it just gets more root mass. So bigger the roots, the hardier the plant, the more drought hardy, the tougher it is. So the more months you can plant before the month of June every year, which is the hottest, hardest to grow month, the more success you're going to have. But take advantage of the rain, the warm temperatures. It's just this is a good time. Don't think it's over. If you just moved into your house last month, you're going, oh, I don't know if I can plant. Yeah, you're fine. Phoenix, no. Lower elevate, but, but up in the mountains, go for it. 
You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our little Janie Gara. Little Janie is a charmer with flowers that float above this 15-inch plant. The fluorescent pink flowers will wow the hummingbirds with Janie's charm as well. Hummingbirds throughout the neighborhood will visit your plants. They're just so popular and only $14. She thrives in hot, dry gardens and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love their native plants to be beautiful and hassle-free, they love to shop. Hi, Elisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Royal Burgundy Barberry. We finally perfected Barberry with burgundy velvet foliage that holds its color through summer, changing to red in fall. Celebrate summer heat and hearty as can be, and javelina are no problem. This knee-high shrub grows with little to no care. A big, bold plant is just $36 and only found at Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love royal barberries, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. All right, I have one of my favorite people in all the world coming into the studio. I like hanging out in small spaces. I like sleeping next to this gal. So this is uh, my wife, <laughs> it Lisa. better be me. Waters Lane. <laughs> she, she comes each week and shares what's going on in other people's gardens. Just to, just to, what are the questions coming through? Uh, either by email, Facebook. I mean, they're just coming in from everywhere. People are really connected uh, mm-hmm. anymore. It's, it's fun to watch people play with uh, Alexa or Siri, or get the, the, the they're talking to their phone and it just responds. It's fun to watch that over and over out yeah. in public. You like that. I, I never talk to my phone, but you're always going, call so-and-so or show me, blah, blah, blah. I have like 1,800 contacts in my phone. All oh my, my business, all my... Everyone, every grower in the West, uh, all their, <laughs> their contacts of fax numbers and emails, it's all in there. And it's hard to find when that list is really long. If mm-hmm. I just call it, if I just speak to it going, hey, show me uh, uh, Jim Roop with Monrovia Nursery. Give me his mobile phone and poof, pops right up and calls, calling. Yeah. I'm going, that is slick. It is. I guess I just, you know, my 10 contacts, I just don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> we had a caller from uh, Kingman last week going, uh, is Kingman the same as, as, as this garden advice? Good for Kingman mm-hmm. as well. I go, Siri, get, Tell me the elevation of Kingman. It's 3,333 feet or something yeah. like that. It's just like Cottonwood or, mm-hmm. or uh, Camp Birdie or Sedona. It's the same elevation. Uh, Kirkland, uh, Hillside, they're all the same elevation. It's all the same gardening. So it just quickly gets your reference going, oh, That's yeah. True. It's amazing. It's the same. Google <laughs> told me so. Well, you've got to believe it. <laughs> right. What garden questions we got this week? They won't need us anymore if they can just ask Google. <laughs> Yeah, but we're entertaining. We're more fun than Google. Your okay. phone can only do so much for you. Oh, that's true. That's true. Okay, so Dave from Prescott moved into a new house. The house has a steep hill that comes down to a retaining wall. The lands- When it was landscaped, they put down like a netting or something to yeah. help with the erosion. Right. But now he says it's just full of weeds, and he thinks some of them are tumbleweeds. He wants to know what's the best way to get rid of the weeds, and what can he plant on the hillside to help sure. with Good. that? Good. Easy, easy, easy. I guarantee it's, it's tumbleweed, and you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, we're starting to see moisture, humidity. It's, they, this is when tumbleweeds really go crazy at the start of the monsoon season. They'll turn into – they'll fill up an office suite. They'll, <laughs> they'll be as large as a VW Beetle. I mean, they're huge. Uh, so they're, that, it's just unique. You can see, you know what it is. So you kill them off. So we've got to spray you know, weed killers. How to keep them off. You can plant. We'll go over plants, what to do, but also how to keep them off. Put weed and grass stopper mm-hmm. by high yield. Uh, it, it's a granular product. You sling it, pull, get rid of the weeds, and then sling this granular product up and down the hillside, and it will keep any other seed from germinating. You'll need water to activate it, but hey, that's what we got coming this way. So have the monsoons get it into the soil for you and then do it twice a year. Weed and grass stopper twice a year. Do it in January and do it in July. So that's January is when all the winter 
weeds start taking off. That's your your uh, um, foxtails and dandelions. And then summer weeds are when the whorehound and the tumbleweeds and the, 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 the goat head, the nasty ones of summer come out. If you do that consistently, you will have 90, 95% reduction in weeds. Mm-hmm. It'll be noticeable. Right. Now going back to his actual question. Yes. What can I use to... To stabilize. to stabilize and keep erosion from from taking down the hill. Lots of your your creeping, low growing shrubs probably ideal. Mm-hmm. So that'd be your cotoneasters like coral beauty, your junipers, all your creeping. There's there's a whole series of junipers like like blue blue rug. It's really it looks like a rug. It's maybe four inches tall and just spreads out like eight foot wide. So you zigzag these things in a in a zipper like pattern up and down that that hillside, and eventually it will take over and it'll just be a solid mat of of roots and st- structures of plants, and you will no longer have erosion or weeds because they choke out all the weeds as well. So that uh, weed stopper, going back to that, yes. that actually does not affect any plants. So you could plant a nice uh, juniper or, or a cotoneast or euonymus, and you could put that weed stopper down. It would not affect the plant at all. It mm-hmm. only affects seed. And so you can put it around other other things, other plants, other trees, and it won't affect your, your the root system. It just affects the seed. Mm-hmm. So I think we covered the pre-emergent and then what to plant afterwards, but what about the weeds he has now? Oh, we've got a real good organic. It's called mm-hmm. Burnout. It's a vinegar, super strong vinegar base with an oil that, would, that gets the plant to receive it. And so you can spot treat that, and it'll be dead within... Not hours, but close to it. Will that work on tumbleweed? Oh, tumbleweed! I don't know. That one's that one's a little harder. Yeah. yeah. So that one, I uh, would probably use the Weed Beater Ultra. This one come in. We'll give you a quick yeah. lesson and show you what's best. But Weed Beater Ultra has a much broader uh, weed killing effect. Uh, and and but the secret with with some of these summer weeds like uh, whorehound, it's got mm-hmm. a real fuzzy leaf, and so the the killer actually floats on top of the leaf, never as penetrates. Or with tumbleweed, it's got a waxy uh, coating on those stems, and so it'll beat up and roll off. Mm-hmm. They're very difficult to kill. In the same sprayer, let's say a pump-up sprayer, put spreader, sticker, and the Weed Beater Ultra in the same container, and you'll have a better knockdown. You get what the spreader sticker does, it forces that plant to go deep underneath that fuzzy leaf or penetrate and wrap around all that waxy leaf so the plant receives more of it. Mm-hmm. And so I wouldn't think about spraying anything right now, bugs or weeds without spreader sticker. It is so underutilized, and but it makes such a difference in your effectiveness. Mm-hmm. So if you ever sprayed something and it came right back, that's because you didn't spray it. It just rolled off right. and didn't penetrate down and do its work. You need to put spreader sticker with the killer, and it'll be a game changer. So another Question is this going to be the weed segment? Okay. So another question is because people ask me this a lot: Should I cut down the weeds first and then spray, or you just leave them the way they are? Yeah, and good spray? question. Uh, well, the the bigger the weed, I mean, ideally catch it while it's small. But if you can't, it got away from you. Ideally, there's a root structure that's as big as the weed top, and so the if you cut all the foliage down. There's not as much foliage to receive that killer to kill off all of the root structure. You'll kill some of it, but not all of it. So the more foliage mass you have, the more it can take in, and the better your knockdown or your kill rate will be, and it will kill the entire root system, not just a portion of it. Mm -hmm. So it's recommended not to cut it down. Spray the sprayer, the, the killer first. Let it do its work. Let it kill, and then knock it down in a week or so. Okay. So things act fast right now because oh, plants heat, are yeah. actively, the weeds are mm-hmm. really actively growing. So spray it and then then cut it back or mow it mm-hmm. or whatever. Weed whack it in a week. And so last question on weeds, maybe. It, <laughs> uh, neither the weed beater or the burnout affect the soil. Is that no. correct? No, they're, they're simply systemic. The plant will absorb it through the root structure. And I think you can go back and plant like within days, right away. So it does not get into the soil. We do have a product called Vegetation Killer. It's actually a soil killer. Nothing will grow. Extremely dangerous. I mean, if you get this even close to your root structures of other plants, it obliterates everything. And nothing will grow for a year. Mm -hmm. So we carry that for 
driveways, foundations, uh, property investors love that because, you know, it keeps the weeds around the foundation away, driveways, uh, patios, block walls or block uh, patios where the weeds are coming up through the, the cracks and the, mm -hmm. it works really well at killing those weeds and keeping them where they won't come back to you. So we use it a lot here at the garden center just because we have two acres of pavement there's a block, you know, decorative block. And so weeds come up. Plus, it's the perfect growing environment. Mm -hmm. So I'll use the Weed Beater Ultra. I don't know if I should share this formula or not. It's just like... I would say no. Uh, it's not on the label. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Don't do it, honey. Don't <laughs> do it. I take my tank sprayer. Ugh. I put spreader sticker and Weed Beater Ultra. And then instead of water, I'll use the vegetation killer in replacement of the water. So I get the immediate knockdown with the... With the uh, um, we beat our ultra, but I get the permanency of nothing will grow here for a year. And it's really a good formula for uh, paver blocks, uh, uh, driveways where you're, it's not just driveway or asphalt. It's actually weeds are growing in the cracks. I'll use it in between the tree lines where things are shaded and just grow. It just helps uh, keep things in check. So I have less labor cost. I like once and done. I'll spend any amount of money to do it once and be done for a long time. Don't try this at home, folks. <laughs> Come see me on the side. I'll show you. Uh, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Once upon a time, Fred the Sage and Bob the Yucca watched a herd of deer eat their neighbor's garden. Hey, Bob, said Fred. It's a good thing we're native Arizona plants from Waters Garden Center. Right, Fred, said Bob. We can handle tough Prescott dirt, hot sun, low water, and we look great in the garden. You betcha, Bob, said Fred. Hummingbirds and bees love us, but that deer sure doesn't. Be like Fred and Bob. Go native at Waters Garden Center. Safe, natural, and organic. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So, container gardens. Lisa and I have over 50 container gardens, and we're not talking little tiny cheesy pots. We're talking big on, full, full like resort size, large home containers. These are glazed pots that will winter over and we've been gardening in these things for decades now. So every year we just add one or two more and collect them. Or if Lisa sees a new style or color, she goes, Ooh, I want that at home. And so we, we start and we're to the point where we're starting to swap plants out, swap containers. Cause some of the styles are kind of dated. I mean, they're not avocado green or, or, you know, that kind of stuff, but, but there's some of them are starting to be more pastels or just that's just out of style. Uh, the drippy pots, that's out of style. The multicolored, that's just so 1990s. So we're, we're more solid colors with the pattern. Just we're changing a few things out. All of our vegetables, uh, tomatoes, roses. We've got uh, cucumbers. Watermelons are grown in containers if it's large enough. So we, we'll plant flowers and a watermelon growing off the back. You're just trailing through the patio. It's beautiful. And so we grow ch uh, uh, peaches, uh, cherries in containers. And so we have a lot of gardenias, front yard and backyard, because we just like gardenias. Uh, perennial, we grow them in containers. And so you can do the same. Here's some secrets or some things to look at. Just some, you know, the, my name's Ken. We're just friends. We're talking over the fence. And here's what's worked for me. So this, is, this is really the insider scoop for the mountains, at least, of Arizona. Less so in the deserts, much more so for the mountains. We have freeze and, and thaw cycles that are really rough on materials. So concrete can flake and crack. Your, your Italian clay just cracks right in two or within a couple of years, it starts to, to bubble and just, just is destroyed. It's that freezing and thawing. It's that moisture in the clay as it expands, as it freezes. And then at night, it freezes. And then during the day, it contracts and it just has this destroying the, the material. You really want to use wood, fiberglass, or clay, a heavy, dense clay. Usually it's going to be Vietnamese, Chinese, 
uh, Malaysian clays. There's some Asian clays. They've got a good heavy clay that's high fired. That's 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 got a a denseness to it. So it will winter over for us. Stay away from the red or terracotta type materials. Uh, those are your Italian clays, German clay, uh, any, anything that uh, Mexican clay. The the molted. It's got the charcoal finished stuff. That I've seen those melt in the rain. So it comes down to the material. I like wood, kind of dated. So wood's kind of like, you know, wine barrels, screams, you know, the 1990s again. But it has a look for certain cabins and areas. Uh, I do like fiberglass, but they're expensive. Just, they're pretty. They're expensive, but they're lightweight. There's there's some benefits to it. Uh, Cast iron, we used to sell those. Those are really great. It's just now the price has gotten so absorbent. And you can't hardly afford them anymore. I really, really like what, what we've committed to mainly. You can get a lot of pot for the money that's high style, that lasts for a long time. I like the, the glazed pots, containers. And so many of you, I mean, you live in a beige house, in a beige neighborhood with beige shingles and beige rooftop. And the beige, everything is beige, like monocolor. To have some color spotted in your, in your containers, even if you don't plant in it, adds style. Then if you add some plants on either side of the driveway or at the entrance of your house, all of a sudden you start to bring that part of the garden alive. It's it's designer. It's, it's, that, it's that color flare. I mean, use bright colors. So many folks come in, they go, I got a beige house. I want a beige pot. I went, oh, okay. We got, we got those. Or earth tones. But why not go jade green? It's, it's earth tone. But it adds just a touch of color so that you get some contrast, something that says, welcome, here's the entrance. Come on in. All are, all are welcome. And with some pretty, uh, something pretty blooming in, in, in that. So there's ways to, 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 to use containers. And it's just so easy. I've had a couple back surgeries where I just can't dig in the yard like I used to. And so containers make it easy. It raises it up where I can get to it. It's easier to, the soil is easy. Um, and I find things that are fragrant, like I told you, we, we plant in gar- we have gardenias. Well, in the ground, it's great, and you're looking at it; it's fun. But by planting it in a container, it raises it up where you can actually enjoy the fragrance. It's closer to you; it's two feet taller, which right there at hip level, where you can just enjoy that fragrance, uh, much more interactive with that plant. Tomatoes. You can pick tomatoes right. I mean, just right there in your face. You're not reaching over at all; just right there. And it's just easier to, to garden in. So it's for me, health-wise, it's just easier. The secret's going to be the soil, though. Now you can use a good potting soil. That's a secret. Don't take regular dirt out of your gardens and fill your containers. It will turn into a brick. It's, it's like a little oven. But potting soil retains moisture, yet drains. It's like this perfect balance. You want to have. You want it to say... A professional grade potting soil. That's that's a secret. So if you can go to your garden center, if you're in in Flagstaff, go to Warner's. They probably make their own growers potting soil mix. So at, what's the best one? They'll, they they know they know which one's growing the best. And so ask them. That's where that garden local resource you know, plant fair up in Payson. Ask them. They'll tell you which potting soil is the best, what's for that climate. And it changes by the climate. For us, we make our own. We just call it waters, potting, soil. That's it. Not very original, but it's our growers mix that we use to to start plants in. So that's what you want to fill and plant directly into it. And away you grow. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Purple Magic Crepe Myrtle. You'll be wowed by the sheer amount and intensity of the purple blossoms that shadow this impressive bush. Leaves emerge as bold red foliage in spring and then turn bright green just as the purple flowers erupt in summer. It blooms twice, first in summer, then again in autumn. And at $39, you can have more than one in the gardens. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Timeless Beauty Desert Willow Tree. Large, fragrant burgundy and lavender flowers appear in big, bold clusters all summer long. This unique water selection is prized for its extra-long bloom time without the need of seed pods. 
The flowers are highly attractive to hummingbirds, 100% Arizona native and just $59. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love their native plants to really bloom, they love to shop. And I've got Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. I would say the grandma with the mostest. Uh, so we're new grandparents as of a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Got to see Emily Rose. Yeah. Is that Emma? What do you do for Emily short? Is that uh, Emma? I e- M- Emily. Emily. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, that I'm going to do whatever I, Pops I can do whatever he wants. Sure but... you will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Emily Rose. Uh, mm-hmm. Healthy, doing well, so yeah. it's kind of fun seeing little babies. He's got uh, uh, brothers, so right. two brothers. Mm-hmm. She's going to be a little dynamo. I think so. Bright eyes, definitely yes. got bright eyes. You forget how tiny they are. I know. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> and fragile yeah. and messy and <laughs> dirty and pinky, just all that stuff. We're glad we're past that. We're into the fun grandparent stage where you can hand the baby back and yeah. go, here, you take. And I do that. You do. I mean, I'm real quick to go, oops, smells. Here you go. <laughs> oops, uh, just once you feed them. Oops, uh, that's not fun. Uh, so I like them when they start crawling. True. Or walking or getting into Older. stuff. Now we can like go climb hills and do things together, not coo. And anyway, that's me, grandfather. <laughs> I like them at all ages. This, teenagers, maybe. Well, I like teen. You know, I almost <laughs> prefer teenagers. I like teenagers. They're fun. I mean, they're 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 moody and and the the hormones are going crazy. But if you get past all that, <laughs> they're really fun. <laughs> they are actually. I do. I do like. They are. They're good. I do like mid high and high schools. So this segment's about inspiration and gardening, not about mm-hmm. grandkids and your family. Or True. your your uh, opinions of babies or not, it's about plants and how to make plants grow. It's my opinions on plants. You're, yeah, we're just full of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got for us? <laughs> so I thought I would talk about um, a, a segment of plants that are amazingly useful in the landscape, especially here in the landscapes of northern Arizona. Um, that aren't really used very often, and I think they should be used more. And so many times, we want to talk about herbs. So okay. most people think about herbs, and they go, "Oh, I'm going to grow it in a little pot in my windowsill, and you know, when I'm cooking my chicken tarragon, whatever, I can have it right there." And that's true; you can do that. But herbs are so versatile and can be used out in the landscape in many different areas, and they are just wonderful because they give you uh, texture they give you scent they can give you color and the other great thing about herbs is they are mostly animal resistant that's true yeah very true i think we grow herbs better here in northern arizona than anywhere else in the country i mean even better than phoenix it's just too hot Mm -hmm. the midwest is just too cold the south is just too humid and think mildews and things happen uh, I think we grow them better because they like the bright, the altitude. They like the dry air. Mm-hmm. They do well with that. And the animals from the javelina to the antelopes to the elk to the deer don't bother them, generally speaking. Now, the, the drought's got them doing some funky stuff right. that we haven't seen before. But yeah. generally, as soon as the rains come and they, they've got stuff they really like, they'll stop eating the rest of your yard. So mm-hmm. it's herbs are really good for here. And they do better outside, I think. They I grow agree. better outside than in a windowsill mm-hmm. ever dreamed of. I agree. They make really, some of them make really good fillers for those perennial beds or those flower pots where sometimes you need a contrast. If you have just flower upon flower upon flower, sometimes you forget to see the flowers, right? So some of your <laughs> herbs can give you that contrast, like using parsley or fennel, or sorrel, uh, rue. They're all kind of just green, but they're kind of a frilly green. It gives you that contrast that you need sometimes. You know where I like herbs? On the back patio, where you're grilling, and people are sitting around, sipping wine, watching the sunset, having some tea, uh, under the umbrellas, or, or just back there enjoying, putting them in the containers where people mm-hmm. brush up against the oh, herbs. Yeah, definitely. This fragrance just starts to fill in or people just can't help themselves. They mm-hmm. have to touch it and smell it and right. taste it. It's just something about herbs that are unique and they're so easy to grow. Why, why would you buy an herb ever again from the grocery stores when you can have fresh herbs right from your gardens right there? Oh, 
I agree. My favorite one to rub is lavender. Oh, yeah. I'll just go out there and just you just rub it a few times and it warms it up and you get those oils on your hands. Very relaxing. I like uh, lemongrass. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very Great nice. Great for mosquitoes, too. Great for mosquitoes. I like uh, uh, fennel's kind of just pretty. It's big. It's aggressive. And, and uh, I noticed the monarchs really like it as well. They do say that, you know, if you really want to get into having pollinators in your yard, fennel is huge because uh, swallowtails, and I think monarchs too, both use it yeah. as food. Yeah. So it's a great one to bring in your pollinators. It also can work uh, really well as ground covers. You can use thyme. Uh, so we have a thyme lawn that is really easy to care for. Yeah, no mowing. We mow it twice a year, maybe. Mm-hmm. We forget to water it constantly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing I like about it, though, is the dogs are out there quite a bit because we like to sit out in the front yard in the evenings. So the dogs go out and they, they're they in that lawn. It takes the abuse of the dogs, but it also gives them a good smell because they like to sit in it yeah. and kind of just, especially the Scotty. I think she's I think she's hiding it or something. <laughs> Her legs are only four <laughs> inches long. Her belly scrapes across the time. <laughs> she does smell good, though. She likes it. She does, it. yeah. yeah. Um, oregano. There's a real pretty uh, golden oregano that is absolutely gorgeous as a real low-growing kind of ground cover filler. Yeah. Uh, rosemary, the Huntington Carpet Rosemary, stays low, evergreen. Terrific for draping over those retaining walls. If you want something to cascade down and kind of soften that wall, uh, the Huntington carpet, rosemary does an excellent job of that. Yeah, and all drought hardy, tough. Treat them like a shrub. Uh, put them on that drip system on that same schedule, and they'd be happy. Treat them like a tree. And once, twice a week watering, they're good to go. Mm-hmm. I think it's all those oils they have in them that just makes them more robust than, than usual. Uh, if we've had uh, coriander is starting to come on. I think we're ready for our first batch of salsa, pico de gallo. <laughs> so I can't wait. So uh, the bay, bay leaves, um, mm-hmm. little tiny bush is starting to flush out in the herb garden and our right. own personal gardens. So you can have that. And I'm going to see if that'll winter over. I know it'll winter in the lower elevation. You know, Cottonwood, Kingman, to, to, right. we had it in Skull Valley. Mm-hmm. That's 4,000, 4,500 foot level. For sure we'll winter over. At the higher elevation where the house is at 5,700, We'll see. I've got it against a uh, east-facing wall. I'm going to ex- experiment. Let's see oh, if it'll sure. winter over for us. I know it goes to zero, but sometimes we can go below that at that elevation. Mm-hmm. A lot of the herbs are great perennials for here. Oh, yeah. You know, some of the your sissies, your basil, not <laughs> uh, mint is a great filler for those areas where you want just something to help maybe with erosion control or you just need something in there to keep the soil so you don't have dirt all the time. But you do, mint can be a little aggressive, to say the least. But we have it beside our driveway because you change the oil a lot there and the water kind of runs off there. And it's a good catch for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't eat that mint. It's just there to be used as a filter off the driveway then when it gets over, you know, too aggressive, you just weed whack it or run it over with the truck a few times. And <laughs> it's back under control again. And it takes that, uh, you know, the brake dust and the mm-hmm. things you do with the car. I'm a tinkerer, the, the cars and stuff. So it, it keeps that cleaned uh, on our driveway for us. I don't mm-hmm. have to worry about the neighbors are going downstream. Right. It's, it's responsible mm-hmm. uh, to, to do that in, in, in your driveway. Right. So a lot of the other things in the herb family that probably people don't think of as being in the herb family are cat mint. Yeah. Uh, oh, tough yeah. little nice rounded perennial with blue flowers. Really, really pretty. Echinacea, coneflower. Yeah. Hyssop. Okay. Um, which, what's the other name for hyssop? St. John's Wort. Right? Well, that's not the other name for hyssop, but oh. that is an herb plant. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, my brain's thinking Latin, converting to, c- converting to common names. <laughs> I forget the uh, hummingbird mint. Maybe that's yeah. what I was thinking of. Yarrow. And as you said, St. John's wort. And we have yeah. some really cool St. John wort in yeah, right now. We don't, we don't use that. It's such a drought-hardy plant. Mm-hmm. I, we don't use it. It's beautiful. You don't use it culinary-wise. Right. But it's just a beautiful plant that animals leave alone. It's a pollinator takes the sun and it shows off in the summer. It mm-hmm. loves the summer. You want to plant it in the summer. You want to wait till now because this is when you get to pick the colors of the flowers right. and that berry that is seed pod that it mm-hmm. puts on. Thank you, Lisa. Herbs for the mountains of Arizona. You can plant them and grow them now. Be right back with more on The Mountain Gardener with Ken and Lisa Lane. 
the Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Gold Star, Potentia. A rising star in the landscape, bathed in flowers as gold as an Arizona sunset. Growing to only knee-high and wide, this shrub loves growing in our sun and uniquely resistant to heat, wind, water, fire, and deer, all wrapped up in a showy little package and under 30 bucks. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love gold stars wrapped in tidy little packages, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Lavender Shades Blooming Penta. One of the best butterfly attracting plants. It's right up there with milkweed, only prettier. Hummingbirds have to dance around all the butterflies of this deeply colored summer bloomer. Plant a few in the vegetable garden to attract pollinators that help tomatoes and squash set more fruit, all for under $10. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love to garden, they love to shop. So Lisa heard me at the bottom of the hour and she just whispered, going, Ken, you should tell them uh, what size pot. That's the number one question we get. What size do I need to grow plants in? Okay, size. What size containers? What I find is, and when it's hot, it's a full sun exposure. Everyone wants that little tiny pot on a tea set or a settee or, or a table or an in, in something with their outdoor furniture. They want a little plant there. That's why silk plants or fake plants exist. You don't want to, well, I can't take that back. Succulents. You could go agaves, uh, succulents, cacti. They might take that kind of heat. But even those can struggle sometimes. There's just not enough soil to keep them really going. And so your soil mass is like a big sponge uh, that holds the moisture and the nutrients, allows the roots to grow in there. The more soil you have, the better the gardening, the easier the gardening it is especially if you're going to grow shrubs. We do a lot of shrubs in our plants. So we've got gardenias. I've got Japanese maples, several in containers. There I would say minimum size would be about 18 to 20 inch wide. And then probably they're going to be about that deep. Sometimes they've got more style. They'll be a little taller. It just depends. But if you could grow even a juniper, a taller juniper, for years and years in that I've got some boxwood. Now, boxwood's a nice evergreen uh, kind of plant in a square pot. Maybe it's a foot by a foot, but it's very tall, about two feet tall. So it's got a lot of style. It's got, uh, it just, it just screams, Ken's got style. Come on out here. Let's barbecue together. We'll watch the sunset. It's that kind of look, but they've been in there for <laughs> 14 years, some crazy time. In fact, I'm getting bored with them. I'm probably going to change them out just because they look good and I'm Board. I want something different. So, and I think that's okay for 20 bucks. You can have a fresh new thing. And I know it's living, breathing. That's going to be sacrilege to some of you gardeners, but you know, sometimes you've been gardening with that plant too long. It's not an heirloom. You're not going to pass it down to the kids. It's just for your enjoyment. And if you like plants, why not plant a gardenia? Why not have a euonymus? It's kind of the same thing with variegation. Why not have something blooming there? Why not a grass? growing in that same spot. But because of the depth, I didn't have the width. It was only a foot across, a square, but it had the depth. So the roots go down, I'm sure, two feet through that entire root mass. It doesn't matter the size or the shape of the pot. It matters uh, how, how much soil that it, that, it, that it holds. A lot of folks you'll read online going, oh, fill it up with Coke cans, aluminum, aluminum cans, lighten the weight, put styrofoam peanuts to fill up, to, to, to lighten the load. I recommend all soil from the bottom to the top. More soil, the better off you are. Yes, it has a little bit more weight, but let's face it, you're probably, you're gardening in a heavy pot anyway. If you're really worried about that, put a, put a caddy or a shelf or something underneath with wheels underneath it so you can roll it around. Don't worry, don't, don't take out, you know, five, 10 pounds of weight by adding styrofoam, who would want that in your, especially if you're gardening with, you know, edibles, tomatoes, that kind of stuff. You don't want petroleum-based styrofoam, aluminum. Who knows what they put on the paint 
on the outside of that can. I don't know if it's toxined. I mean, oh, well, I drink out of it. I'm going, yeah, that doesn't mean you don't get cancer later. And I don't want it in my soil where my squash or my watermelon are going to be growing. I want soil. Soils, the more soil, the better. So if you need to worry about moving it, move it around with a plant caddy. We've got every size you can imagine to go underneath it. You can roll it around the deck or the patio, wherever. So that's just my take on it. Uh, trees. We grow some trees, quite a number of trees. How many trees? And big vines, like with the, with the uh, like, uh, uh, what is that, English ivy with the structures, you know, the, 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 the balls and the, the, you've got towers and all kinds of shapes you can plant and have that vine grow in and take on that shape. We do that a lot. So these are big plants. They're standing as tall as you and I, uh, but we're, we're, we're actually watering those for bigger pot, probably 20 to 24 inch large, uh, the, the peach tree, which is my biggest plant. It's, it's very tall, very big, produces very heavy. It's in a two foot by two foot by two foot square fiberglass pot. It's been in there for years. And then I have flowers underneath it kind of overgrowing the space just looks really good. And then at the backside, I've got a cucumber growing over the backside where it just, I've got edibles and, and flowers all mixed in together. It's pretty. People go back there and go, wow, that's really nice. How creative. Oh, look what you did. Because it's got style with the color of the container. It has style with the plants that I put in there, just unusual textures and mixtures are put together. And it's just easy to grow in. But this, the biggest mistake people make, they, they go with plastic. Plastic pots don't breathe. They're hard to garden in. I just, I've struggled so, but you can do it. It's just, it's harder to play. And then eventually the sun gets them where they break and they're brittle. I just struggle with plastics. I'd rather go with wood, but eventually wood, you'll pick it up and the bottom just drops out as the bottom rotted on you. And it's a little dated. I really like clay as long as you've got a hole drilled in the bottom. You've got drainage. If you don't have drainage, uh, the plant, the, that container will just fill up with water, more and more water, more and more water, and finally your plants will drown. In fact, I just had a small pot. I'm growing, what am I growing in that? A jalapeno pepper and some, uh, I've got jalapeno with a, I think a cucumber in the backside, and I've got petunias on the front side. It's very pretty. And I've got a decorative cage in it. It's just very pretty. It's artistic. And it was struggling. I have two of these matching pots with a piece of art in the middle, big statue, and I've got, oh, one, one was thriving, gorgeous. The other one was struggling, wimpy, yellow. I'm going, what is, what is going on? I looked at it and the soil had clogged up the small hole in the bottom so it wasn't draining. So the pot was filled with water. I took a screwdriver and just poked it in the bottom. You know, went, just poked a few holes. The water started draining and that plant has rebounded dramatically all of a sudden. It's starting to catch up. The color came back, started to take off. But that's when the drainage got got uh, clogged. I probably should have put a, a rock or pantyhose. I've heard that in the bottom, I'm kind of dating myself just by saying the word pantyhose. I'm, it's fabrics in the bottom, a coffee filters I've heard on the bottom just to keep the soil from, from getting in that drainage hole and, and uh, clogging it. I just, I, I just dump soil in and grow. I just start growing and it clogged it up somehow. So it was easy to fix. Now it re rebounded. But watch that. Make sure you got drainage. And then the soil. You go up to your big box store. And man, they got so many soils. It's ridiculous. And you notice none of them say potting soil. They'll say garden mix. They have every kind of name. It's very confusing for gardeners. We're used to growers mix or potting soil. Those are the names that are professional grade potting soil. And they don't put them in bags where you can see anything. It's all high colored with a generic name. And you're supposed to garden in it. I really do your homework. Ask around. This is one, the soil is so important. I would suggest not buying your soil. It's going to be sacrilege to some of you. I know, or I'm a Walmart customer. I like Walmart. Go to Walmart. But they don't have the best soil and stay away from that miracle Grow garbage. It's not going to help you grow. It's not good. I'm telling you, you're going to struggle. Even though it's containered, you got the drainage, you're doing everything right, you will struggle. This is one where your soil, you probably do want to go talk to your local garden center, your nursery, your mom and pop 
backyard neighborhood nursery. They're probably making their own soil in the back, or they've had someone make it and they know which one grows, and they're probably growing their own plants in that same soil. If you can take a plant that's grown, let's say it's a, a year old plant, if you can put that plant, if you can put it in a container with that exact soil that it's been known that's entire life, if you just put it in a, in a container that's full of more soil like that, you will have great success. If you take a plant that's, that, and put it into foreign soil, just something totally different that it doesn't know, plants do not like to make transitions. They're kind of like people, but their roots especially, they like to go from one soil to no other kind of soil. They want the same kind of soil, right? So if you can get that nursery's growers mix, the same soil that they've been growing in, and just fill your containers or your raised bed with that, you will have tremendous success every single time. Do your homework at the very least or ask around your, your local nursery and they can guide you right in. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Pink Volcano Phlox. Just when spring flowers are fading, these beauties revive and show off. Your grandmother only dreamed of growing a pretty pink phlox this fine. Each flower cluster could make a bridal bouquet all by itself. This new volcano series is erupting with flowers used to accent entries and fountains, all for $15. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love eruptions of pink flowers, they love to shop. I grew up in the family business with my three sisters, and I've raised four of my own kids in the same garden center. Waters isn't just another business in town. This is part of our home, an extension of who we are. My family spends more time here than we do at home. It's basically an extension of our living room. We just have more friends over than most. My name is Lisa Waters Lane, and you'll feel welcomed, peaceful, and at home here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road, here in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So some things to really watch as we wrap the show up here. Uh, watch, take advantage of the growing season that's coming. Even if you're not planting, don't you're not going to plant a thing, but your plants will grow even though they've been in for 10 years or they're established or you bought that house that, you know, from someone else and their landscape's pretty nice, but you want to take care of it, and keep it, go, keep it growing. Fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. I can't emphasize this enough. In the month of July, sometime this month, fertilize, plant food, a good granular food. I'm not talking that miracle Grow salt mixed garbage in a box. That stuff is not good for your mountain gardens. It might be good in other parts of the country, but it interacts with our water and does more damage than good. It's salt-based. You should not add that and mix it up and it's expensive and it just does more damage. Get a good granular food. And might I be so bold as to say, use organic foods. We we are all dealing with, with groundwater. We're all poking a hole in, in the ground putting a straw in there and sucking this water out, and then your cities will distribute it out to us. But it's all groundwater. If we're all using a whole bunch of Scott's Turf Builder or chemical-based, you know, petroleum-based products that water-soluble, they get picked up by our uh, flash flood and wash downstream, it is going to get into the water table. Let's not do that to ourselves. A good organic food breaks down slower and so the plant will take up more of it. It's healthier for the plant. It's healthier for us. And it's just as easy. We, we pre-blend our own food here. So your, your garden centers will have this. It'll probably, you'll probably have to go to a garden, a nursery, a mom and pop backyard neighborhood nursery to really get the right fertilizer for your area. But I would, they'll know organics as well. I have stopped selling chemical-based fertilizers because I think it's best for our community. I'm going to sell three truckloads, semis of fertilizer. I, I can make a difference in our water table. I can make a difference in your garden, in the, in the community. So I have a responsibility to 
promote, to teach, and to sell the right plant food for us, our own personal health and your plant's health. So of water, we make, we call it all purpose plant food, 744 for you numbers, folks, 7% 7, 7 nitrogen, 4% pot, uh, phosphorus, 4% potash, but it breaks down slowly and it lowers the pH. So the cotton seed meal in that mix, it's all granular. So you spread it around. It's got an earthy smell. I know it's offensive to some people that aren't gardeners. It smells like a barn. It's got bird guano in it. It's got stuff. It's pelletized. It spreads, but it greens things up. It lowers that pH where the plants can receive it better. We go deep into fertilizers uh, throughout the with our garden classes. But right now, just for this last moment, fertilize sometime. Pick a food that's granular that you can spread, preferably organic. Preferably buy it from me, Waters Garden Center. It's good for all the all the mountains of Arizona. It even works in the deserts, but it really is made for the mountains here. Uh, but we get that on so the plants can they can grow. This is their growing season. This is when they really take off. They really put roots on. They really put uh, more foliage, more more flowers on right now. So take advantage of that and the rains uh, that are coming. It'll make a difference in your gardens. Throughout the week, we teach classes, garden classes. Every Saturday at 930, we've got a garden class. They're free. They're here at the garden center. They start at 930. Uh, next week, it's grapes. I've got a, a viticulture guru. I mean, it's local, ex, the expert coming to teach. Uh, they're going to go deep into all things, uh, all things basically about grapes, how to get production. And then the, the week following, we've got container gardening and then perennial flowers that bloom and impress July 28th. Take a look at those at watersgardencenter.com or Facebook forward slash Waters Garden Center. We're here each week throughout the week. Uh, if we didn't get to your garden question, come talk to us. Uh, Lisa and I camp out here throughout the week, put a lot of hours here at Waters Garden Center. Have a good week, all of you. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. I used to be cocky and actually dared to beat the big boxes at their own game. Since the beginning, we were known for the very best plants in town. But with youthful ambition, we added a line of inferior plants, contractor grade, that matched the box stores and beat their prices. We failed miserably. The plants were side by side. Waters hand-picked quality at the higher price and the inferior plants at the lower price with astounding results. The inferior plants, not bad quality, just not full and nice, were still there a month later. The hand-picked quality plants, they had been restocked twice and the bench was empty again. The youthful cockiness, it's tempered and with age comes wisdom and knowing who you really are. Waters Garden Center doesn't compete with the marts and the boxes. We simply grow the very best plants our family is famous for. We will never offer inferior plants. Cross my heart. Pinky swear. Waters Garden Center. 1815 Iron Springs Road here in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.